The title of this message is Disconnected, and it uh, flows out of deleting destiny, the idea being that as we are disconnected from the things that God has called us to be connected to, that we will engage the destiny that God has for us. Back in the 90s, there was a big push for destiny. All these authors were writing about it, and it was really a big deal. But one thing that it sorely lacked, severely lacked, was the concept of that we all experience destiny together. It's not a lone uh, process that we go through and we grow and mature in. It's something that we do together as a body. And, uh, you know, if there's ever been a time to analyze the effects of being disconnected, right? We have a lot of data. So I'm going to share some of that with you. I know I'm preaching to the choir that here at The Rock, we really value community. It's talked about from the mouth of every pastor constantly. We believe it is the best course and set of priorities for you to have to grow in the things of God. But for the sake of context, I want to share some of these uh, uh, statistics with you. Stanford University researchers found, this is staggering to me, that over 42% of the labor force in the United States now works from home full time. 42%. Talk about rapid societal evolution. Just how quickly things have changed and many of them are not planning on going back. They've already get, let go of the leases on their office buildings and they're planning on a permanent uh, fixture this way. In one county, the statistics from the educational system says that F grades are up 90%. Wow. D grades are up 77%. Failing grade, failing a whole grade up 38%. Suicidal thoughts increase during the pandemic from ages 18 to 24. Look at that. Young adults from 10% up to over 25%. From 4.3% up to 11% amongst all ages. That's from the CDC. Even more alarming, the CDC says that they did a survey and asked young adults if they had seriously, seriously considered suicide in the last 30 days, one in four. One in four nationwide. Tulane University makes this statement that I believe is extremely profound. Social media, communication via social media helps some people stay connected to others, but it can lead to isolation. If it becomes a substitute for meaningful conversation and in-person socialization. So now, uh, I, I want to be clear here because I love the opportunity to engage in virtual media. It has provided a lot of ministry, healing, support during this time that we wouldn't have otherwise had. And, and, in some cases, it's gotten people into community that were somewhat disengaged prior to COVID. So it has a lot of fruit hanging off of its tree, but ultimately in the long haul, it won't be enough. At some point, we have to realize that we are to gather together, to minister to one another, to be a body, and that is important. I heard an author state the other day in the context of this conversation, it only takes 30 days to develop a new habit. So think about that. For several months now, we've been establishing new behavioral patterns, new habits in our lives that are pulling us apart and isolating us from each other in different ways. Now, we should have a biblical worldview about this. Now, what do I mean about a biblical worldview? It's interesting. At times, I will talk to people and they will have processed and postulated a worldview. 
And in the course of the conversation, I will ask them, could you give me chapter and verse on that? And I hate to say it, but more times than not, they've said no. Now, the reality is, for us as believers, the way we look at the world should be through the lens of the understanding of God's word. We should be able to look at the world through our understanding and not just give one chapter and verse, but give multiple. This was the culture of the day. This was Paul's letter to the church. This is what Paul said to the church. And this is why I believe this when I take a, a, a political worldview, whether sociological, eco, uh, economical, or uh, political. Every point of view that I take should be founded on the word of God. So if you have points of view that you believe are true, go into the word and see if they are. That's my, that's my encouragement to you. That is an exhortation. We have, the grass withers, the flower fades, the word abides forever. Right. Establish your thinking on the word and your thinking and your actions will not return void. They will accomplish everything you send them forth to do. So that's, that's my encouragement to you this morning. Also with this isolation that's taking place and this disconnectedness, that means that with a biblical worldview, it's up to us to know the truth and to intentionally help those who have been sucked into the vacuum of isolation and hopelessness because that is what flows out of isolation is hopelessness. And that's important because we have an hope that we share as an anchor of the soul. It is a hope that spans eternity. And people need to know that hope. And there are people that you know that are in your social sphere. And they need somebody to come up to them and say, God's got your back. Let me pray for you. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. They need to hear that. And open the door. Unfortunately, it's only after a period of time that we really experience the ravages of neglect or isolation. So some scriptures that come to my mind is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be watchful, for your adversary the devil prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you've ever watched any uh, what do they call those shows where it shows the lions? A National Geographic or a nature show. That's what I was looking for. <clears throat> um, the, you watch lions, they always isolate. They always isolate the weakest in the herd or the youngest and they pick them off and that becomes their dinner. And that's how Satan prowls around. He wants us divided. He wants us separated. We're easier to pick off. The strength that we experience being united in the body is unbelievable, but it is only something that can be experienced through faith. If you don't believe it, you won't experience it. You got to believe it. You got to believe what the word says about the unity of the faith. And exercise it and have corresponding actions to your faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord. Hmm. I read that yesterday. My first thought was, we are prisoners of the love of God. We are prisoners of his grace. We are prisoners of his mercy. We are prisoners of his divine wisdom and insight. We're prisoners of his revelation. Man, what a great life we have. What a wonderful, beautiful life we have. 
I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. Why? Because we have to deny ourselves to do this. With patience, bearing with one another in love. Then he says to be eager. Everybody say be eager. We got to be eager about this church. We've got to be eager to maintain the unity of the faith. Be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Be eager. I challenge you, many priorities can get in the way, but be eager means this is a huge priority. This eclipses many things on your priority scale. Be eager, look forward to it, anticipate it. Through this lifestyle, we build the kingdom. The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He goes on to say there's one body, one faith, and and all of that is uniting conversation. It's about, hey, we're all in one family, we're all in one faith, and we're all together on this. When I saw that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, I thought about the very first time I really understood what it meant to be bonded to someone. And what I... Uh, the first time I heard this, you guys all look like a bunch of judges over there after the. <laughs> Are you guys going to hold up like a scorecard after my message? <laughs> Pastor Mark was a 7.5 or an 8.0. <laughs> wow. I better kick it up a notch, Brandon. I want a good rating at the. Anyway, I've got to get through this because we have some really cool stuff at the end of this service. So I'm just going to blow through this real quick. There is a bond between a husband and a wife, and that bond is sacred and holy in the eyes of God. It is the only thing that God equates in his word to the, mer- the, the union between Christ and his church, the bride. It is a sacred and holy thing. And if I were to ask you right now, on a scale of one to 10, give me your bond rating with your spouse, you would come up with a number almost instantly. Because we know instinctually, emotionally, that there is this bond that exists. And while it is a combination of both of you, it is something very real. And when I understood this, I began to pay more attention. What's my bond rating? Because how can two walk together unless they're agreed? And when your bond is strong, agreement is easy to come by. uh, Problems are solved easier. So that bond rating is important, but just as even more so important is we have a bond with God. You know, what's our bond rating with God? What's our bond rating with our children? What's our bond rating with the body of Christ? The bonds that we have with our kingdom family play a significant role in our fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. My brother Doug was talking about this the other day, and he said, one of the greatest challenges for church leadership in our time is to convince the body of Christ that authentic biblical community is essential. It's a popular word right now. It is essential. The unity in the body of Christ generates a symbiotic relationship where I rejoice in your successes. I weep with you when you weep. It's something that we experience together by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have to skip a lot here. As a church, we have a shared destiny to reach not only the world, but our local community. We have some awesome God-given strategies for this year. My encouragement to you is let's live our faith together. Uh, But if you want to go ahead and come up, John Maxwell uh, has a famous statement in leadership teaching that says, 
you're only as successful as the people you surround yourself with. And I tweaked it a little bit. I believe uh, uh, we're only as effective as the kingdom family that we surround ourselves with.